Okay, afternoon, everyone. Um, I think we'll start the meeting with a good few attendees now with us. So this afternoon session, uh, reflections on the future of spine surgery after the pandemic. Uh, so I'll start us off today. Uh, then we'll have uh, Carrie Mann uh, looking at uh, her current practice um, during this um, uh, exceptional time. And Javier will finish our session with um, looking at predictive modelling uh, and outcomes that potentially can help us uh, plan for the future. A um, bit of housekeeping. Uh, we'll pause for uh, questions at the end of each talk. Um, if you have any uh, questions, there's the Q&A section on the toolbar. Um, so just type uh, any questions you may have and we'll cover those um, after each talk and potentially at the end um, of today's uh, session. So, uh, start. Uh, I'm Andrew Bowie. I'm a uh, orthopaedic surgeon based in Newcastle upon Tyne in the north of England, um, also the sub dean of medicine at Newcastle University. So, this um, pa pandemic's really uh, given us a bit of a kickstart to the future. It's thought that in the UK that we're now in 2025 with regards to um, the tech that we're now in implementing across hospitals. So, it's actually been a bit of an advantage to us, um, certainly from a, a teaching and a tech point of view. Um, but clearly there's been a big change in what we do. Our normal uh, educational opportunities have very much been lost. Hugest impact on our trainees, um, which is what we need to really focus on. But we mustn't forget about ourselves, our training and our future career developments and uh, surgical uh, training that we need ourselves. Most of the issues, obviously the usual social distancing, um, I think we've all found how important being close to other people is um, and that's really stopped how we uh, interact and educate and learn. Uh, so much so, our university has closed, um, all face-to-face -face teaching has stopped and indeed our medical students had to graduate and give their uh, um, Hippocratic oath um, online this year, so really um, real big changes. Emergency surgeries only, so clearly that affects our training and opportunities to learn. Um, and we can't go anywhere. And um, this is a picture of the UK skies a year apart. And for the first time in a long time, there's not been a single uh, aeroplane in the sky over the UK. Um, and that's also shown by Zoom, uh, where we are today. Indeed, it's um, turning in um, more profit than all of the five big airlines combined. So big changes uh, from us not being able to move around. So obviously training is limited, reading, um, we can always read, our trainees should be encouraged to read, video conferencing um, as we are now, uh, but really one of the options and big problems that we have is there's not necessarily acceptable practical options to train uh, when we can't do that uh, as we do now. We need to look for the future after um, the pandemic has finished or finishing, uh, there's gonna be a huge backlog in surgery, surgeons exhaustion, maybe exhaustion just from Zoom conferencing, so we might not be wanting to do this for much longer. Um, study leave might be cancelled, and obviously travel bans are in place, which might affect uh, the training options that we have. Some people might be lucky enough to have, you know, very good local facilities if they're a university-based hospital, so they may have cadaver labs, but a lot aren't. And so we need to work around and think a bit smarter on how we can deliver our teaching. Simulation has been made and used for a number of years. I'm sure we've all started off by suturing on pigs' trotters. We've put um, pedicle screws in saw bone models. Uh, laparoscopic skills have obviously been taught in the simulation environment for a long time. Uh, robotics, particularly the da Vinci robots, it's a really clear uh, model of preparation there. And then we move on to the more novel techniques. So the main issues that we've had previously and ongoing with all of these non-patient training situations, it's the haptic feedbacks. Nothing quite feels like the real thing. Um, sore bones don't feel like real uh, pedicles and cadavers aren't anything really like um, people. There's the high fidelity of the training. So chopping through an artery in a cadaver doesn't really make much difference to us, but obviously doing that in an air operating room and things aren't going quite so well, that's a different training mod uh, modality. And this costs and uh, obviously access to these um, expensive things. Normally, most of the techniques that have been employed for teaching and education is when we've got a new 
um, technique that people aren't familiar with, so laparoscopic skills, for um, instance. But we very much rely on what technologies are available at the time, and that can be um, limiting, uh, partly due to funding, partly due to we just don't have the tech to do it as yet. But times are changing. So when I started laparoscopic surgery, um, it was an ice cream box with some sugar cubes in that you stacked. Clearly, things have improved. There was no option for any arthroscopic practice other than on a patient. This is obviously a very expensive and, and bit of a one-trick pony, so not really useful and probably where, not where most hospitals would be investing their limited education funds. Robotics. I think this is really key to how we see the future of uh, training. Just like uh, when you go for a flight, the pilots spent many hours in the simulator, as is the case with da Vinci type robot surgery. But we should really look at this as an opportunity. We're never before and never again, hopefully, uh, for some time anyway, that we'll be in a situation where we've got this time to plan and hopefully investment uh, for the future of uh, different education modalities. Um, the Royal Colleges, they're looking at a lot of different things, particularly the future of surgery and how it is um, expanded and performed. One of the reasons for this is there's a huge shortage of access to surgery and therefore we need to have more surgeons or upskill people to do surgeries that wouldn't necessarily go through a normal surgical training program. But obviously we know that um, people die if they don't get surgery, so we need more of it but also people die because they get bad surgery. So we need to ensure that our surgeons are appropriately chain, trained and uh, you know, we make sure we do what we can uh, remotely before uh, they're allowed on patients. And again, this follows a report through the NHS published early last year about the digital future and plan for our um, training and healthcare. And you can see a number of things um, look quite common nowadays. And certainly I'm sure a lot of us have been uh, looking at telemedicine more recently. Uh, which we never chose to do before. Excuse me. So planning in the surgical era, we need to um, work out where we are with our training modalities. Hopefully one day when we get good enough teaching um, on uh, VR type platforms, we might even be able to stop people becoming surgeons in the first place. So cut them off soon after medical school um, to ensure that people don't essentially waste their time spending many years trying to become surgeons when ultimately we're aware that they don't have the skills um, to ever be a proficient surgeon. So we look at a different surgical training paradigm. So there's a lot of time that we can use planning and then um, spending time on our own uh, in the virtual world, which um, is cheap, it's effective, and you can put as much time in as you wish. And obviously we go uh, a bit further forward to the cadaver situation, whereas I say actually in the future, when the haptics get good enough, um, cadaver labs will start to disappear. So there's uh, obviously the lack of social distancing here, uh, but certainly um, this is how surgery was taught, but really it's not too dissimilar to how we do it now. I'm essentially observing um, in close proximity to someone else doing it, but clearly I think this uh, obviously needs to change and the virtual world would be where um, we all start to live. So very commonplace now, hollow lenses, already used in, um, uh, in treating patients actually. So here we have a CET scan that's uh, superimposed onto the headset um, of the person doing a spinal injection. And obviously this helps not only with training but accuracy of actually how you treat, treat people. Um, you can see this slightly dated photograph, but ultimately NASA's been doing this for a while. Um, again, the main issue is looking at the haptics technology and getting that sense of feel and touch, which um, is the key to any uh, practical procedure. But we're getting there with spine, so I think people would probably agree this is a pretty realistic uh, image of an exposed spine. But now we can use different haptic techniques. So although this obviously although this obviously looks nothing like um, a real spinal operation, the hand-eye coordination and the feedback from these machines actually does allow us to appropriately train. And um, although I heard this lady's posture is rather bad while operating, we can also look at posture and how the technique throughout works throughout 
And this system itself has actually been ratified by the Royal College and both the American Academy. So obviously there's a definite drive to the virtual route. And here you can see the number of time and hours spent um, hopefully will pay off. Obviously there's an ability to potentially rank um, students and uh, clinicians, which will always uh, create some competition and with competition hopefully comes some excellence as well. So you can't uh, avoid looking rather stupid while um, we're living in the virtual world, but ultimately you can do this in a classroom um, with a small bench and you don't need um, much space or overheads. So thoracic um, thoracoscopic surgery, something that we're moving back towards um, within uh, the spinal uh, field, obviously not common to surgeons. So we have this small set top box um, which we can then turn into um, the virtual world. We can superimpose or change things to help the learner um, become more proficient at it, um, which will allow us to move around to the technique. You can create whichever surgical um, operating room you prefer. Obviously, a sunset's very pleasant, but you can have a good look around and you can put as much detail as possible to really allow yourself to get used to the, to the virtual world get used to putting the instruments in the correct position which has obviously help you uh, gain proficiency and we're getting very clear images of the inside of the chest and certainly this is better than any cadaver if anyone's done thoroscopic surgery in a cadaver it's just horrible it's wet and there's a lung everywhere so this is a lot better and more like reality and again we can move around and get that touch technique so we've got a clear view of what we're doing, getting our hand-eye coordination properly engaged so we can upskill people in a technique that previously was uh, less common. Um, and obviously this is a much easier thing to replicate in different environments than just um, trying to get people upskilled on cadavers, which are few and far between, and as mentioned, uh, not very easy to use. A really, I think, um, exciting possibility is proctoring. So when you team people up, so as we do now, we go and see a surgeon operate, then they may come and watch us do our first operation of a new technique, such as OLIF, or a less um, formal te common technique. Um, but this can also be done remotely. So with the use of cameras, headsets, speakers, and microphones, obviously we can have someone in a different country talking to someone so we can see what's being done and they can uh, give advice of uh, what to do next. And indeed, you can have multiple people in this environment from all over the world. Certain cases, obviously, this will be uh, very good for. And then you can really get to grips with see, this hip operation uh, with a number of surgeons from all over the place. And by doing this, we can upskill more people, potentially um, be omnipresent um, and uh, be all over the world trying to help deliver excellence in surgery and training. So as we can see, this um, uh, review is from 2008. So the laparoscopic surgeons have somewhat got ahead of us on this, but plenty of publications now prove that this is a very worthwhile technique and useful. And we're slowly getting there uh, within spine surgery. Um, and we are also showing that it's a, a useful um, and exciting and novel approach to training. So the future, um, clearly I think this is in the virtual world. Um, augmented reality is going to make a huge um, improvement to teaching and education um, soon um, because of all the modeling. Um, they'll be able to give us indicators while we're operating um, as to the most appropriate next step. So we'll paint by numbers, um, which would be interesting. Uh, the robots are coming. Uh, they will eventually steal our jobs. So important for us to get on board now and start using them because um, it's certainly going to help with a lot of training as well. Uh, so that concludes uh, my first section of the talk. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now um, and obviously um, contact me in the future if you wish to. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, this was an impressive talk and uh, this is a spectacular and now we have to think that this is only the beginning. So we have a lot uh, to improve here. 
Uh, I remind the attendees that we have some questions and answers. So in the bottom of your screen, if you have any questions, you can just type them and, and I'll go ahead and read them and, and ask Andrew about them. And uh, before we have one question for the audience, oh, there's one over here. Andrew, uh, have you tried these tools already? In, in which cases have you tried it? Um, so I have um, done some pre-operative planning, uh, not actually in the operative operating room, but by using uh, virtual reality um, hollow lenses, um, we can uh, see the same sort of image, certainly by looking at 3D images um, and digital modeling. So I've done that to pre-op plan with surgeons remotely, um, not yet in the operating room, but we are bringing that into our trust uh, shortly uh, with, the, with another company. And you're doing it in deformity cases, in, in thoracic, or you're doing uh, posterior fusions or screws? What are you able to do with these tools? So, so our current plan uh, with the main VR project I'm working on is to upskill surgeons on thoracoscopic surgery. Um, it's not widely taught, um, and certainly uh, there's a role for that coming back, especially with people moving towards spinal tethering. So rather than doing lots of mini open or thoros or thoracotomies, um, by doing it all thoracoscopically, obviously it's a lot cleaner. Uh, but to upskill people quickly without sending them on another year's fellowship somewhere. Um, by doing this and having people lots of time to practice uh, in-house um, on their own um, because it will know where um, you should and shouldn't put your screws as part of the program um, that will very much um, improve uh, technique hopefully. And what about the accuracy of a, of a real patient? Uh, what is the touch that you have with the tools or it, does it bleed? It doesn't bleed. Can you feel the bone when you get in? Yes, yeah, so um, it, the, the, it depends which program you, program you run. Um, certainly, um, it's, it's good. Bones are a good one. Putting screws in it is a good one because you can get a hard endpoint. Um, when you're doing things with soft tissues, um, the, the feedback is getting better. But I've trialed this on DaVinci robots, and you do get some feedback, but also, um, you, you know, um, if you do too much on the uh, DaVinci plan, you will tear that um, vessel. Um, and although you might not get that immediate feedback, you get the visual feedback, so you don't do it um, in the real, real world. Uh, there's a question also from the audience. Uh, do you think that the, the, we, we would be able to do remote surgeries in the future? And I th certainly in the fullness of time, absolutely. Um, I think what we're realizing now is uh, and the more I've worked with different um, people with regard to virtual reality training or, or anything like this, and the skills are already there. It's just we've chosen not to necessarily adopt them within medicine. Um, ultimately, everything that we do in life is a process, and every process can be um, broken down and learnt. Um, and with machine learning, there's, there's no reason why that won't eventually happen. Um, obviously, uh, it's a bit scary, but um, many things are automated that we choose not to realize. Obviously, planes can take off and land all by themselves, um, even though there's two pilots sat there. Um, I think there'll be a similar point for our, us. And as we're seeing just with the, the new spinal robots coming out, that um, very much um, the surgeons are there, but potentially technicians will be there to use them one day. And, and ultimately, maybe not even technicians. Um, there might just be a it all entirely automated, but I think certainly that'll uh, be far after my career ends, I think. Okay, and, and the last one, uh, for the sake of time, uh, uh, what is the cost of this uh, of these things? Are they really expensive? Uh, uh, who runs with the cost? Does the university or the institution, does it? Yeah, so I think it's, it's very sort of personal to the, to the area of healthcare you work in. Um, obviously, just like everything, you know, our computers are a lot cheaper than they once were, and the more um, people buy them, uh, the costs are coming down uh, considerably quickly. Um, you can get hollow lenses for about a thousand pounds, which um, isn't too expensive, and um, certainly for the individual, yes, but certainly for institutions, no. Um, they're cheaper than uh, a cadaver or running a cadaver lab, and I think that's really what we need to think about when we compare and look at um, the new haptic technologies that a lot of them are software based so 
you need a few basic tools, you need the headset, um, you need some a few haptic instruments, obviously for your hands, but they can be used across the board. So not just spinal surgery, but um, general surgery as well. So um, I think very affordable um, and certainly uh, a lot, yeah, a lot cheaper than a cadaver labs. Well, uh, thank you very much, Andrew. I think we can move on to the next topic. So Dr. Carmen, please. Hello everyone, thank you. Uh, so now we're moving into a um, more everyday topic uh, that is uh, uh, the question of uh, what will be the, the potential impact of uh, this uh, pandemic on our everyday life. So uh, let me just open my presentation here. I hope, yeah, you, you have it, hopefully. Um, so um, the potential impact of this for me is probably that uh, COVID-19 is a global crisis. It has paralyzed not only our work, but also our nations. So we were forced into a wait and see attitude in crucial domains like economics, education, as uh, said Andrew, uh, also non-emergency medicine that, that we know. And uh, spinal surgery is one of uh, these that has been paralyzed but most of us had to face other things in our private lives. Spine surgery is a highly impacted speciality because uh, the majority of the situations that we deal with uh, relate to either chronic pain or functional impairment. So it's called elective surgery, which means that it is not something crucial and therefore uh, we, we have to postpone our patients. So how to manage these patients? that are on waiting lists, how to restructure our organizations, and what can we learn from this crisis that we are all facing. So uh, the problem now is that we have to prioritize uh, our necessary operations that uh, have been delayed, but we are still uh, with the, the problem of um, all the, the health, the public health information that we have, and we are uh, on an everyday basis uh, decision-making with all our national societies that are giving us different guidelines on how to manage the crisis and how to manage the after. So we are on a moving earth. So this is how we were before. We were well organized. We were surgeons with a busy schedule with patients that were scheduled uh, ahead and everything was well organized. And suddenly everything is just, uh, destroyed and now we have to think about how to pass the shock and uh, we have to think about how we are going to reorganize our personal lives, our works in terms of patients management, patients waiting lists, our hospital team management, but our, also our scientific activities, meetings, but also all uh, the scientific work with our students. So how to turn it into a positive impact? I think that the main message probably when I had this topic to, to deal with is to reinvent ourselves and to transform our working environment. Of course, it's uh, um, just an idea initially, and then you have the reality coming back because every day you have contradictory uh, informations, either by the national health uh, institutions or your hospital or even within your own practice. The first thing probably that we learn is that what we thought that was boring, the meetings, is a must. The strategic management uh, and uh, the real-time needs, resources, and means uh, thinking is really important. Team department management is crucial, but also uh, the importance of a closer relationship with hospital managers and administrative that some of us were uh, a little bit in trouble with. Uh, and this helps every day during the crisis, but even after, to have a better knowledge of the different roles and functions of everyone in the hospital. We had to change a little bit our functions. Some of us had to do a different job than the one that we were made for, but suddenly we are more empathic with the other ones and we can discuss about the real problems that we had to face every day and how we are now using our closer relationship to rebuild our ways of uh, working. 
the only goal of everything, and I think this crisis is really pointing it out, is that the patient is in the center of everything. So we have to rethink about the streamline of the patient journey. First thing is to keep in touch with our patients. Before we had the clinics, we had patients calling in our offices, coming to our departments to meet us. We gave, us, uh, we gave them advices, decided on surgeries, and uh, we started to organize things according to the guidelines, making tools and documentation, literature that we had, the knowledge that we have. But this, since the beginning of the crisis, everything is a little bit changed. So we had first to update lists of postponed activities to keep the list of patients that were uh, waiting for us and for news, clinics, but also surgeries. And what we did also, and we are in this now, is that we pointed out the aggravating factors of each patient and recalls that uh, were also recorded in order to see those who were in real need of help from us. Within a couple of days, we organized uh, what, uh, teleconsultations, which I experienced in the Northern countries a couple of years ago, but were not yet a common practice in France. And things were made very quickly. Very important thing that we, we learned today from this crisis, the fact that teleconsultation and other ways of um, using new technologies um, is really easy to implement in your everyday life. It's just a decision making. And when you are in a crisis, usually decision making processes are quicker. Distant spinal rehabilitation protocols are also very useful. And within one week, we organized what we call the co-video for our patients who were either seen for a first operative control between the second and third month, or for those who were waiting for surgeries with back, back pain, and they were put on the surgical waiting list. Another thing that we are now implementing also in our practice quickly is the prioritization tool to reschedule the postponed cases. Teleclinics is uh, based on the face-to-face -face calls for those who are used to this. Uh, what I did, because I had to start it during the crisis, is that I created a checklist that I can share with those who are interested with a guided physical exam, and I could help my patient to do exactly the movements. Of course, with the younger ones, uh, kids under the age of five, it could be difficult, but I could also manage it with neuromuscular patients, especially if they were in some uh, healthcare centers. Uh, and this could help me do something that was closer to my usual practice. Of course, um, the, the use of imaging was quite difficult. And still for now, I try to think about the essential, not the superfluous. Uh, try to have strictly necessary imaging using distant praxis that are now available through the country, or postpone the radiographic control and uh, propose another meeting with the patient a couple of uh, weeks or months later. Prescriptions are sent by email and uh, everything is quite well organized to, to keep uh, medical information of the patients in a securized field. And finally, the orthotic management can be also uh, maintained because the orthotists are in their workshops and they are following strictly the national sanitary guidelines in order to reduce the risk of COVID diffusion. This is the distant rehabilitation protocol co-video. And again, I can share with you the, the, uh, the YouTube uh, uh, link for this. Uh, we have created within one week with our physiotherapists that were awaiting for uh, having some work to do during this period where they had no patients. Uh, we asked them to create these videos in order to have uh, stretching uh, reinforcement but also um, good uh, proprioceptive exercises that patients could, could do. And we had different levels according of uh, the fact that patients were recently operated on. If 
they had pelvic fixation, if they still had back pain. And um, we also organized teleconsultations between physiotherapists and the patients. And we are now in a prospective study uh, with patients that are included and seen by the physiotherapist every 15 days and by the surgeon every uh, month in order to see how they are uh, uh, progressing and if the surgery can still wait for them. So you see that uh, the coordinated patient journey that and this is a drove that we were working on in order to have something more uh, easy and essential for the patient uh, with a quicker access to the different specialists and to have the best treatment according to the disease they have uh, has been uh, probably accelerated by the, the COVID crisis. The main issue for us today is the waiting list and uh, for now, I can, I can just share with you how I am managing in order to learn something from this and also to make it uh, more uh, uh, organized for, for our patients. It's a real new concept for uh, the French people because uh, we uh, had enough surgical uh, teams in order to manage uh, deformity cases and low back pain patients. But today, uh, our waiting lists are just exploding like many countries. And we have to learn from those uh, in the Nordic countries, from Australia, who had to uh, face this kind of waiting lists. And we have to think about the prioritiz prioritization tools, the specific team for uh, scheduling, and the resources to manage this uh, particular uh, part of the management of patients. Team organization is crucial. You need to have a head and to think common in order to manage all the patients that are waiting. But you need also to uh, take into account all the different guidelines that are given by public health institutions related to the uh, COVID plus patients. Uh, guidelines given by your hospital in order to reduce the risk for the different caregivers in the hospital to reduce the risk of infection. And then you have to prioritize the medically necessary operations that should not be delayed, but then you have sometimes contra contradictory guidelines developed by national college, like National College of Spine Surgery, orthopedics, pediatric orthopedics, or anesthesia. So in order to uh, help locally the different people of the team i started to work on a prioritization tool until i, I read re very recently uh, the paper done by the, the the american college of surgery uh, that i recommend you to read uh, and uh, which is uh, uh, on free access that gives you a very efficient prioritization tool in order to manage your waiting list Managing a waiting list is not looking only at your picture as a surgeon. Usually, surgeons look at severity of the disease and different factors like the risk of evolution, and uh, they are working on, on this uh, efficiency of surgery. But there is also now an ethical question about how to make disabled patients wait or not wait for elective surgery. And it's, instead of having a case-by-case -case basis or a week-by-week -week basis, prior, prioritization tool is efficient to help you to organize your uh, time, whatever uh, the way the operating room are going to open, and however the new guidelines to uh, avoid the risk of COVID or not within the hospitals, within uh, the ward, or within, within the OR. So how to prioritize? We have to take into account the usual elements of our clinical judgment and decision-making as surgeons, but we also have to take into account other crucial factors like the risk of COVID-19 infection for teams and over-risk for other negative patients. We, uh, I think all of us have specific guidelines from national uh, societies and the governments. Uh, we have to take in account also the risk for some patients to have an acute postoperative respir respiratory failure that shouldn't happen if they get the COVID-19. And we have also to take in account 
what is the usual preoperative evaluation of an anesthesiologist and not only see the surgeon's picture. The factors to score today, and these things, you will find them in this paper and are, I think are already in your own fields, uh, is first the question of the option of a non-operative management, uh, because usually if you don't have a waiting list, surgery can seem to be appropriate because the patient is asking for it. But if he has to wait, he has sometimes no other option than getting into these non-operative managements. It can be bracing, it can be physical, uh, physical therapy. And as I said, you can have also this uh, distant teleconsultation with the patient and the physiotherapist. Um, it can be the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic confinement on disease evolution or outcome. Some patients will worsen and some patients are stable. The impact on surgical difficulty and delay of a bad evolution, what we call uh, the, the loss of chance of the patient is really crucial, but it's very difficult to measure sometimes. So it may need not only radiographics, parameters like uh, cob angles or worsening of a disc height or anything. It can be also questionnaires. And today I use EQ5D. I use uh, the um, kinesiophobia score, which is uh, the TEMPA. And these different factors can help as well as the consumption of drugs uh, in, or in order to reduce their pains uh, and also the psychological effect on the patient. The patient negative factors actually related to COVID are demographic, age, lung disease, obstructive sleep apnea, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, immunocompromised patients, um, but also things that are related to the procedure and that are usually screened by the anesthesiologists, which are uh, the need for intubation, postoperative ICU requirements, duration of hospital stay, surgical time, complication risks, and anticipated blood loss. But all the, hours, uh, uh, the, the risk of contamination through the positive airway pressure devices. The winner uh, in this crisis is probably research and education. Uh, today we have probably more time for online education programs like this webinar. Uh, different national and international societies uh, propose different types of education online, either uh, through webinars, but also sharing the content of meetings that were postponed. So it's a, a very uh, interesting and uh, uh, fruitful uh, period. Uh, it's also very good for team management because you, we uh, are uh, having more time with the administrative and we can try to implement some of their tools in our everyday organization. We can also uh, personally follow up our students and we have more time for weekly conf calls in order to follow their works. And I think for most of those who had scientific publications waiting on a table, it was an ideal period to finalize them, which is a new hope in order to have more research time in our uh, busy schedule. So what will I learn from this pandemic? I think that COVID-19 acted probably like an electric shock, but um, I think we have more positive things than negative things to take from this crisis. Probably first the fact that uh, the health and uh, disease management, our uh, work is uh, more quality than productivity. Um, we had a positive effect on the reorganization of our processes. We learned uh, how to crisis, uh, which includes waiting list management. And we could also develop and mature very quickly other means of communication with our patients through teleconsultation, with our teams and hospital managers, but also for our scientific production. So now I would say just do it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karima. It's a really uh, interesting talk and um, really important for us to hear a different uh, outlook on how, how to manage this, this crisis. Um, just a question for myself. What do you think is going to be the um, main obstacle or um, hurdle to you restarting sort of your normal elective um, practice? 
Um, actually, we are restarting since the beginning of the week our elective cases. Uh, the big problem is that uh, we have different um, college that are contradictory in their guidelines. Like uh, the spine surgery college is asking us to do a CT scan and to test all the patients. And the anesthesiologist college is not asking for the CT scan. So we have to take all these guidelines and to find local compromises. So the, the main problem is the fact that we need a lot of meetings to work together to find the right way to do things. And when you are on the meeting, you're not with your patients. Uh, and uh, the, the, the main problem, the main limit probably is this uh, constant flow of information and guidelines that are coming to our ears and are changing the perfect organization that you have settled for one week and that it's changed the next one. Uh, so hopefully uh, within uh, two or three weeks, as we are just at the end of the confinement, uh, if there is no relapse of the pandemic, uh, probably people will be more relaxed with having one decision making and one way to organize things in the hospital. Because as we don't know exactly what will happen next week, we try to maximize the security for everybody but it, it doesn't serve the ones who are waiting for surgeries. Thank you. And um, I've, we've just seen here on the Q&A section, uh, there's a question, uh, do you have a special disinfectant plan for your OR like uh, for after MRSA patients? No, not at all, because uh, our OR is quite new because it has been completely renovated and uh, the uh, epidemiologist, but also uh, the infectious disease doctor uh, has uh, had visited our OR and decided that uh, we had uh, um, an airflow renewal system that was completely adequate, like in the airplanes uh, and even better. So we didn't need to, disinfect, uh, to have a disinfection after uh, each patient. The only thing that we do is that we, uh, ask nobody to get into the room during the intubation and extubation period. So the anesthesiologist is alone uh, with the patient and uh, the uh, one patient will be extubated in the room and in ICE, the patient will have an area of 10 uh, square meters without anyone around in case he has to a cough or uh, anything happens with his fluids. Thank you very much. Um, very similar to what's, what's happening uh, in the UK right now as well. Uh, thanks, Kariman. I think uh, now we're over to Javier to um, finish with our last talk today. So uh, following this uh, risk uh, assessment of patients and comorbidities, we can take a look on how to stratify these risks and, and make predictions uh, for modeling results. Um, I'm going to center my talk in adult spinal deformity, as Kariman has already touched the pediatric uh, spine. So the uh, usual flow is patient and then it goes through surgery and you improve the quality of life. But this is not always so linear. So sometimes you have complications in between and this can affect your results in quality of life. So how can we minimize these complications and then improve our results? So the best way of doing it is to understand very well how the patient and assess how the patient is, and then assess how aggressive our surgery is going to be through planning and, uh, and the surgery. And for that, we have uh, different tools. For the patient assessment, we have two tools, uh, which is the frailty index, and we'll go through that in the, uh, the questionnaires. And to assess how surgery is gonna be, uh, we have tools for surgical planning, and we also have tools to calculate or assess or measure our aggressiveness in our surgery. All these together make uh, the stratification of the risk. And once you have stratified the risk, then you, have, you can do predictions on complications and results. And these predictions are made by models, and uh, they all go with, uh, one, under one word, which is artificial intelligence. Uh, this uh, is based on the, uh, on the uh, database that we have uh, put together between ESSG and ISSG in the States. And the first thing we did is to see 
why we had major complications, and what was the weight of every parameter. Uh, we saw that 55% were related to factors uh, depending on patient. 40% of our complications were related to our surgery, and only 5% were related to the site and the surgeon, which uh, surprised us uh, at the beginning. So if we start with the patient, first thing to say is uh, what is the meaning of frailty? And frailty is simple, is the difference between chronological age and physiological age. And this frailty can be measured. Uh, we have a lot of indexes uh, for different specialties, but uh, Miller in the ISSG came out with this two years ago with the frailty index just specific for spinal deformity surgery. And this is based in, in 40 items. Some of them are comorbidities and the rest of them are, uh, are the questionnaires. And then uh, depending on how many you have positive over those 40, you get a ratio. And this fraction will tell you if you're not frail, frail, or severely frail. Uh, the construct of this uh, frailty index comes, the essential part, from patient-reported outcome measures, the PRONS. Uh, so for each patient, we give the NRS and the COMI score, the OSWAS3 index, the SRS22, and SS36. And with this, all together, all put together, we can calculate the frailty index. And we have seen the frailty is an independent risk factor for major complications, that being that those severely frail would have more wound infections, PJK major complications, and reoperations than those patients non-frail. Uh, this is from last year because we have now learned that many of these uh, factors from the patient can be modifiable, and there are some of them. So there are guidelines already to optimize the patient before going into surgery. This specific guideline that I show here comes from the Cleveland Clinic, and it has four different, it touches from di four different areas. One is the medical area, so for example, nutrition or smoking or prehabilitation pre for sarcopenia. Another thing is to take care about the bone health or the psychology of a patient with educational materials and, and also anxiety and fear that we are last seeing that these two affect a lot the, uh, the results of our surgery. And then of course, patient selection. Uh, the younger the patient and the lesser, the fewer the deformity, the better the results and the less the complications. Finally, this comes up to where you are going to run a marathon and you have to prepare for this marathon. So we have to take this left lady, the lady on the left, and put it as the lady on the right to go through the big surgery. And if we do that, uh, SETI already in, in Washington, in Seattle, has come up with this uh, result that if you do these measures, you can decrease in 50% the incidence of surgical complications of 30 days. The second part is surgical planning and invasiveness. So we already have tools for that. We usually use the uh, normal x-rays, MRI, CT scan, flexibility x-rays, and uh, patient uh, examination. And we did that already, but we have new tools that we can use uh, to help on that. Uh, we use specifically the KEOPS system. We know that sagittal profile is very important and the uh, restoring the ideal shape uh, is important to avoid mechanical complications and the KEOPS uh, can show us with drawings and, and images uh, what our goals can be and how to plan surgery. In the ESSG, we also plan surgery with a GAP score. You know that these, uh, it has uh, four different items, uh, which are pelvic version, ideal lumar low doses, low doses distribution index and sagittal alignment. And uh, you can calculate how many, uh, how many uh, correction you need in lumbar span and the distribution to uh, try to minimize the complications, the mechanical complications in the patients. And we, all, we also have simulations, so we can simulate our surgery, three different surgeries for the same patient and see which one of them will fit uh, better for our, our goals, our surgical goals. There's another tool that we can use is the ATSCI score. This ATSCI score uh, has been developed by the ESSG a couple of years ago. It's, it's uh, very intuitive. So you, uh, the number of uh, segments that you fuse or decompressions or the uh, pelvic fixation if you do or not osteotomies. And then it gives a 70% accuracy on the uh, complications, uh, actually on blood loss and uh, duration of surgery. 
which are directly related with complications. And you can measure so your aggressiveness of your surgery. So now knowing the patient and knowing the surgery, uh, you know the risk of taking this patient from point A and point, point B. And this is where artificial intelligence comes uh, into play. So what we have done is we have poured into the machine every patient from our two databases with 213 variables. All these variables go through uh, the machine's brain and then gives you results. So the more patients you pour into the system, the more the machine is thinking and refining those results. That way you're pouring and rethinking and refining is called machine learning. So actually the machine is redefining all the results to be more accurate with time. Um, we have taken all these variables uh, through the machine and the machine has decided to uh, organize the patients in three different clusters uh, and cluster is meaning patients that are very similar I can be grouped by their similarity and if you see here on the left we have uh, three different clusters young corona so there are young patients undergoing surgeries old patients undergoing revision surgeries or old patients undergoing first-time surgeries uh, you can see this on the left we have also clustered surgeries itself. And the uh, computer has decided that there are four groups of surgeries that we usually do from less aggressive to more aggressive and has uh, scaled them into four different stages. So what we do, and you see here on the left, you can combine each patient cluster with its surgical cluster. And then we can see what were the results that we have obtained with these patients at two years. And you can see, for example, a young coronal patient with a osteotomy. This is the rate, the first line is the rate of improvement of the different domains. Whether if you operate a revision case and a simple, for example, a simple surgery, this is the rate of improvement that you go and expect from these patients. And the same we have done with major complications. So at the end of two years, we have seen these patients with this surgery will get this rate of complications. And this is all set into the computer. So once you have a new uh, patient in front of you, you're going to put all the data into the system, and then the system is going to choose all the, the group, the small group of patients very similar to yours. And now knowing what had happened in the results and the complications with these previous patients, he, the, the machine is going to be able to predict what is going to happen with your patient in terms of outcomes and complications. And this is what is called artificial intelligence. So we have put this into practice, and uh, you can see this in two busy papers uh, from last year uh, and from the calculator. So now we have a tool that we are uh, practicing with, online tool, in which you, would, you are gonna be able to put your patient demographics and, and, and uh, frailty index, your, uh, the, how the disease is and the treatment uh, that you're gonna use, and then this is gonna pop up into the engine of the computer and it's gonna calculate the risk of complications and of the improvement on your outcomes. So for example, here on the left is a 24 year old or a 70, and then it's going to tell you the, uh, the percentage of improvement that you're gonna get on your outcomes and overall your MCID. And the same thing with complications. So it's gonna calculate the rate of complications at three days, 90 days, one year or two years. And this is actually the tool, how it works. So you enter a patient, you enter the patient profile, you see here female, 10 years, weight, uh, whatever. And then you put the comorbidities, just to calculate the frailty index, and you put your PROMS results and your radiographic uh, uh, measurements. And then you're going to calculate or plan the surgery that you want to do. This is, for example, a T3 pelvis with uh, osteotomies or, or cleaves or cages or whatever. And then you run the simulation, it's going to predict the likelihood of improvement of your results at two years, the ODI, the SRS22, or the SS36. And this, which is the most important for us, is going to calculate the complications that you are at risk of. For example, at 60 days, this patient has a 20% rate of mechanical complications, and at two years, this is going to rise to 42%. And this we use right now in our counseling to the patient. So we do individualized and specific uh, risk calculation, calculation for each patient. So you can do individualized medicine. 
actually the, the uh, patient is going to suffer high risk of complications, you can modify your planning, your surgery to do it less aggressive, and then the program will recalculate the rate of complications with this new surgery. Uh, we have also developed another tool. This was an idea of Chris Ames. So what happens if a patient is in the borderline between two different uh, clusters? So the machine is gonna be uh, quick enough to identify the 100 patients neighboring that one, the, in the independent on the cluster, and it's gonna tell you what the surgeons did on that specific cases. It's a very similar case than yours. So 80% of the uh, surgeries went down to pelvis or they stop at thoracolumbar junction or they used or didn't use uh, osteotomy. So that way we can, little by little, make suggestions for the surgeon knowing what other surgeons did uh, so they can have indications for the surgery. And also is going to show what is going to happen with the results at two years for those neighboring uh, patients. Uh, what are the future challenges of this tool? First thing is try to make it simple and easy because uh, the, you have, we have two options with the tool now. You can put all the 147 variables or you can go to a simple way, a uh, shortcut with 40 variables, but actually you have to put the variables in the system and that takes time, it's not easy. Second, we have to prove that this is better than current surgeon's estimation. And we're doing a, a study this year and we have seen that, uh, that uh, surgeons overestimate uh, complications in the early stage, but underestimate complications uh, at one and two years. And then uh, proof, the, this tool is universal. So uh, this is done by very specific surgeons working on the adult deformity. So we want to know if this can, um, can fit also a normal surgeon with no, uh, no high uh, volume of, of surgeries. And the last thing is that uh, this tool only is accurate in 70% of, uh, of uh, the prediction. Uh, we still have some var variables that we have not uh, accounted for, and we have to study uh, those variables like genetics or, or muscle or biopsies of bone uh, and all that stuff. And this is uh, in the years to come. So thank you very much for your patience, and um, I'm ready for, uh, for questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Javier. Very uh, nice talk and very interesting uh, uh, tools to apply to reduce the risks of our patients or to give them full information on their surgeries. Uh, do you know if uh, you could implement the today uh, in this specific period to help you uh, to decide on which patient to operate on how to manage your waiting list, because I think you have the same problem as us. Uh, thank you, Carmen. I think this tool is advanced, more advanced than that, because this is only, only for high comorbidity patients, adult deformity surgery. And uh, actually, the first steps in the COVID pandemic uh, needs to be easier. So we have to do easier cases. For example, we're starting with discs uh, degeneration or hernias. Uh, simple surgeries with one or two days overnight, or casts uh, with uh, in the pediatrics or lengthening. So this tool is all is going to uh, serve for patients that have high comorbidities. So I don't think this is going to solve your problems of the waiting list in the nearly future. But this is more to uh, play with it uh, for the next future for for normal situation. Okay, and uh, um, do you, do you know? Uh, um, how we could easily deliver these informations to the patients because you said that it could help medical counseling, but um, is, is it something that the patient can understand easily once you have made all your calculations? Yeah. The most difficult part is to put the variables into the system. So that for that, you need help because there's a lot of variables and actually there are very specific variables. So if you don't have the ODI, you only have the SRS-22, you're not gonna be able to calculate that. So it has to be very complete and this, this is the first step. The second step for the patient is easy because once you have the tool and you press, you press the button, it gives you a graphic and you, that graphic you can print is only one page graphic and you can show the patient, this is your complication rate, are 60 days or 90 days, and you can actually recalculate it by doing your, your surgery less aggressive. And they go home with that uh, page or two pages information 
individualized for them. And then they come back and some of them say, look, I'm not ready for this. I'm too old for this. I'm 78. The risk is 50% in the first six months. If you cannot do something simpler than this, uh, I prefer not to get in. So I think it is going to be a valuable and useful tool. Okay. And then you can discuss maybe another option uh, with less uh, improvement in terms of PROMS, or uh, will you just ask the patient to give his uh, um, opinion on, on the surgery that you have decided? Do, uh, the question is, are you mo uh, moderating, uh, modulating your decision making according to the reaction of the patient? Uh, for sure. This is one point. Yes, for sure. So you have to take into account the patient. There is a little trick in here. This is done by all by statistics. And you know that in statistics, we have associations, uh, but not causality. So uh, if you lesser your aggressiveness of your surgery, then it would be associated to less complications. But that doesn't have to be true because it's not causality. You're playing with, um, with numbers and with statistics. So actually what we're doing right now is the surgery that you need has these risks. We can do a smaller surgery, just a foraminotomy, or we're not going to address the whole, the whole problem. We're gonna improve uh, your quality of life in this amount. And then if in the future you have more problems, we can go with a big one. And this is what we actually do in our practice. Thank you very much, Javier. So uh, I'll let you maybe conclude uh, this webinar as uh, we have just uh, uh, concluded on your last presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you for the panelists. Thank you, Andrew, for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Karaman. I would also want to thank uh, Metronic for this invitation and all the audience for being here. And uh, just a simple thing, once we finish the uh, seminar, the webinar, you're gonna have uh, two questions or by uh, to fill out if you kindly would do that. So thank you very much and see you next time. Thank you, bye everyone.